Hey, Jessica. Hey, everybody. Hey, Robert. Hey, y'all. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Can you in? Waiting for Instagram to connect. There he is. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Where are you? Well, I'm in my office. Okay. So you're in New York? <laughs> I mean, I came for the day and I thought I was going to stay the night and I think I'm being very chicken and I'm going to go back to Connecticut tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, I thank my, you for... Uh, thank my building is Coronavirus Central, so... Okay. Well, connected. thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Let me do a little little intro. So thank you everybody for joining. This is a Thinking of Art call series um, where we're uh, introducing artists and creatives from around the world. Uh, today, I'm really excited to introduce you to Robert Couturier. He is a, a French architect and, and decorator who's contributed to major architect and design books. Um, he's lectured at galleries, art fairs, uh, participates in charitable causes, You've done some amazing projects. So with that, welcome to the Thinking of Art call series. Thank you for taking time today. Um, can you first start out um, how you got started as a, as a decorator and architect? I think that uh, I always knew that this is what I was going, that was made for, that I was going to do. I, I don't think uh, I had any other call. <laughs> and I always loved looking at art, always loved looking at houses. Um, I was always interested in them, and I love people. So if you love people in houses, then what do you do? Yeah. Well, you, you found your calling for sure, and early on, yeah. um, I know one of your, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, one of your biggest projects, if not the biggest project. At 32, you were chosen by uh, Sir James Goldsmith to do that 20,000 acre, 60,000 square foot palace. In, uh, in the Pacific coast of Mexico. So can you talk about that incredible project and what that was like? This was, I had worked for him before because I had done the house that he had bought in New York. And mm -hmm. he, we, we remained friends and he was telling me about the property that he had bought in Mexico and that he was going to do something really Mexican and it had to be a certain way and, and I was listening to it fascinated and I said what a wonderful idea, a wonderful thing to do and then he called me and he told me, he said people don't understand what I mean, you have to come and translate for me, for the architects what I want and then, and then we'll have to figure it out and so I went yeah. down and I met the architects because there were two properties and mm -hmm. I think it was very difficult for both of them to understand Jimmy and how Jimmy lived and what he wanted. And I was trying to explain it to them and I did. And then Jimmy said, well, you have another month to do a project and then we'll come back with Robert and then we'll look at what you've done. So a month later we came back and then Jimmy looked at everything and decided that there was nothing that he liked. And he turned around and he looked at me and said, why don't you do it? And then I looked at him and I said, well, because, um, why <laughs> and uh, and he said well you have and you're 32 is this you're 32 at the time yeah i was 32 and i thought okay uh this is probably the chance of my life and this is what i have to do no the, the truth is is that there is no um you know there is no miracle i just i just was very young and i had no idea how complicated it was going to be and had I known how complicated it was going to be, I probably wouldn't have wanted to do it. But, you know, what did I know? And so I started working for him and we did, uh, and one house grew to another and the property was huge and we did everything and all the houses, the gardens, the village, the, everything. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible experience. Actually, the first presentation was in Istanbul. We were on the Bosphorus. And he had rented a boat and we were on the Bosphorus and then we were looking at all the plans and all the drawings. It was very mm -hmm. inspiring. So that was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it lasted for, I worked for Jimmy from 1988, 1988, 1989 until 
2000, until 1997. So it's it was incredible. a long time. Yeah. Wow. Well, with your with your clients, obviously, it becomes like a marriage, right? So you develop such a good, you know, close relationships and, and bond with them. Um, can you tell some other stories of some incredible projects? I mean, you're passionate about so many different things, but I think maybe a, like a French chateau or something like that, uh, particularly so I'm did, interested in. Yeah, we I've done, I think in, uh, in my life so far, I've done what, four of them, four French chateaus. Mm. Uh, I think that you have to approach it with very much modesty, which I don't think I had at the time when I did some of them. And I think I did that I probably shouldn't have done. And I've been more respectful of, you know, the history of the places themselves. I think there is yeah. a problem sometimes when you, when you feel that you know so much that uh, you are allowed to do things because you know almost better than anyone else. But truth is, is that you don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think modesty is the best way to be. And I think to think that you know everything is an immense mistake. That actually we probably all do when we're quite young. And then with age, it sort of goes away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I hear that. Um, can you, and you published a number of books. Can you talk about the first book that you published and that, the process that you went through? It's, um, I, I'm not incredibly comfortable sort of talking about myself. And, and so the, <laughs> idea, of, the yeah. idea of a book was, you know, something, like, where am I going to tell and who's interested in anyway? yeah. And uh, um, my public relation then decided that she pushed me and said, you have to do it. It's just everybody has a book. Everybody has a book out. You have to have your own book. And so we worked with Rizzoli. And uh, they were incredibly nice. And it was actually, it was a little hard to do. It was, mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult thing to look at your own work and write about yourself. And it's just always easier if someone else does it rather than you. Because you don't want yeah. to also appear to be so self-laudatory. But, you yeah. know. Yeah, no, I understand that. I, I get a sense that you're more of an introvert than an extrovert. Because I, I am as... If that's the case, I am as well. And it's when you have your own business and you have to constantly push yourself and promote yourself, you're going to force to be an extrovert and there's a misperception there. So, how, really? yeah, were you, were you a shy kid growing up or what were you like growing up? I was, uh, I think I was a very shy kid growing up. Um, I, um, I had, you know, I didn't have an incredibly happy childhood. And I went to boarding school when I was seven years old. So I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time away. I mean, I think going to boarding school wasn't a bad thing in itself because it taught me to become a bit of an extrovert and to sort of, you mm -hmm. know, I have to go out and have, make friends and be, you know, be sociable. And, and then mm -hmm. from sociable, I became incredibly social. And, yeah. so, and I started going out in Paris a lot because that's what, you, what we did. And, um, but I don't, I don't think I became an extrovert for that, I think. And also I have, a, I have incredibly deep friendships, which I've had for, you know, with the same people and new people as well, but I have incredibly deep friendships and I intend to keep them and try to keep them for as long as I live and as long as they live, because I think that's what is the backbone of your life. Yeah, absolutely. It's the memories and the relationships that we have, 100%. But then work in many times, you know? Yeah, 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 sure. So, you know, with COVID and not being able to travel so much, do you do you have some places that are on your list to go when you're able to travel again? Well, uh, I have to go to Los Angeles next, uh, in 10 days. And oh, good. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Going, are you here? Oh, good. I'll come see you. I'm good. Yeah. I'm leaving on the, on the Wednesday, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, and then I have to go to France in July because I have a house that, I'm, that I've been working on is being moved in. So they're moving in in July. They were supposed to move in at the end of May, and obviously this mm -hmm. put uh, a big halt to all of it. And so it's going to happen in July, so I'll go there. And I'm looking forward to it. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday about 
traveling. And she said, you know, you have to consider maybe that it's the end of tourism and the end of, uh, of traveling yeah. the way it used to. Because, you know, yeah. It. So it's yeah, really it's... strange. This whole situation is everything is the same and yet nothing is the same. We're all the same. We live in the same mm -hmm. places. But life will never be the same. I know. It's... I hear you. Yeah, so it's just... mm -hmm. yeah, it's really interesting. It's going to be interesting for us all to go through that. Um, I miss all my New Yorkers out there. So anybody that's on the call from New York, I sure miss everybody there. Um, can we talk about some of the images? I know when we were promoting the call over the last couple of days, we shared some some of your kind of uh, some images that that your team sent. Of one was an English country house. There's a Manhattan apartment. If you guys have seen some of the stories on my Instagram, uh, you can look at those and and ask any questions. By the way, um, and we'll we'll get to those. But can you talk about some of the those projects? I mean, how you mix you know, your beautiful aesthetic with design into the contemporary art. And there's also uh, other genres of art in, in these images. So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I think art is something that's obviously personal to the clients. And I, all, I intend to shy away from uh, recommending art because I think that it's, it's something that's very personal, obviously, mm -hmm. and in some cases incredibly expensive and I don't think that you really want to take the responsibility of having somebody buy something for millions and millions of dollars and it not being what it pretends to be. So I think I always try to um, try to stay, I mean I would of course counsel the client if they want to and always, you know, and I will tell them well, if I think it's beautiful, if it fits, if I think it's all of that. And it's an immense joy to work with beautiful art. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's wonderful to work around it. It's uh, sometimes, you know, we, there was one piece that we had bought, there was this huge Rothko and with very particular colors and we had done the apartment before. And so when the, when the piece of art came and then it was installed and we looked at it in the room and we said, oh my God, it looks like if it belongs in this room, we have to change yeah, it. It's and we had, to, we had to change the room because the room all of a sudden looked like if it was meant to have a Rothko in it, which mm. then is nothing more awful than to just decorate around your art, especially if your art is art and not decorative arts. Decorative arts are different because they're meant to be part of the decor. But art is a very... Uh, it's, excessively personal and should remain personal and so you have to work it work it that way and there's some art that's more contemplative and there's some art that's happier and you have some art that's that is more joyful and you have all so many different different things and it's very often a direct reflection of the per, of the person and it should yeah. always how much does art influence your design process well, I think when when you work with someone who has a, an important art collection, I think uh, art is, you know, everything evolves around it. I think that the the, the incredible respect and and, and uh, the love that we have for art is uh, might sometimes be a little bit exaggerated because you know there are other forms of art, and I think that. Sometimes you have the problem of art collectors who collect art, but they don't collect furniture and they don't collect carpets yeah. and they don't collect objects. And so they have, you know, these uh, these places, these apartments that are more like art galleries than they are a personal house. And I think that the interest that one has in art should cover everything. And mm -hmm. it's not only a painting. It has also to be you know, the, the, the appreciation you have of artworks that are maybe purely decorative, maybe it's only furniture or mm -hmm. it's only fabrics, it's only uh, colors, it's only, you know, um, silverware, I mean, whatever. But I think that the appreciation sure. you have for one form of art should cover all of them. And for architecture, of course. 
Yeah, and I know that you have some design heroes and I wanna ask you about that. But there's one question that just popped up. What and when was your first art purchase? Um, I think my first art purchase was a little drawing by uh, Greuze, which uh, I bought when I was, I think, about 19 or 20. Mm. And, um, and I've, you know, I've bought, obviously, I've bought quite a few things along the way. And, um, and actually gave that drawing to someone. I gave it to a very, very close friend of mine in uh, thanking for a favor that he had done for me. So, you That's know, nice. and art should, you know, move that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, it creates a beautiful legacy um, it, that way. So can we talk about your design heroes or Frank Gehry and Jean-Michel Frank, and there's many others, but can you talk about some of your design heroes? Um, you know, actually what my first design hero when I was, uh, when I was, uh, very young growing up, I think was obviously Jean-Michel Franck because I was very uh, influenced by the aesthetics, by mm -hmm. a, a certain form of, of um, sobriety in the design. There was, uh, there was, it never was overly decorated. It never was opulent in, a, mm -hmm. in an obvious way. It never was uh, outrageous. You know, the funny thing is that you have certain houses, I mean, especially houses that have been owned in this, in, by the same family for a very long time, which mm -hmm. have never been decorated, but they've been sort of, you know, things have been piled up haphazardly sometimes, and the houses look incredibly beautiful. And so you look at them and you think, what makes them so beautiful? What makes mm -hmm. them uh, so remarkable that they could stand on their own without having mm -hmm. anyone deciding, you know, this should go here and this should go there and you should do this and you should do that. And some houses that are, that are completely designed by people who feel, by designers, by people like us, and feel that, you know, they are not personal. And, and what is the best house? I don't know what the best house is. Is the, is the best house the house that's best designed? Or is, in, or is the house in which people are happiest. So it's very difficult to uh, sure. to sort of- Hopefully they're gonna be happy in the best designed house. <laughs> <Or not. laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, has, has that happened before where you've you know, gone through the process and, and they're, they approve all the plans, they're very happy about it, and then they move into the home and they're like, well, we just don't feel this energy or we need something changed, the vibe is off. Like, I'm sure you know, that, is that? This has never happened to me. I mean, mm. in details, of course, because whenever, um, you know, whenever, you know, you, you finish something, you always have things that have to be changed and then things that have to be refined and, you know, sure. replaced, whatever. I mean, that's completely normal. It's also that it's very difficult for anyone to sort of look at plans and then see the house done and understand entirely what is mm -hmm. being done. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we professional, we know, we know, but sure. how do you, how do you know when you're not a professional? So yeah. I think some yeah. of the prizes that are not so great. Well, but you add so much, so much uh, value to the process, um, which is incredible. So um, there's another question that just popped up from Elizabeth. It says, if one inherits an older house that has been in the family for multi-generations, then how does one make it into their family home? It's a very interesting question. It's very difficult because, you know, some people uh, inherit a part of the family that, in, that they inherit from. And some people don't really like their families. Mm -hmm. And some all sort of inherit a house and it reminds them of a parent that they of a parent that they have never liked sure and so though know, the house is beautiful you know it's difficult to stay in a house where the people that you have known who've grown before who've owned it before you don't you don't really like and so and also tastes are very different in in a lot of ways though houses that have been occupied by the same family for a few generations, there is always 
a linearity that exists that makes every generation add almost what the house needs. And maybe there's a spirit of a house, an esprit de famille that exists, that is transmitted to the next generation and for the next generation to continue on and not rupture with what they've inherited. So mm -hmm. some, some people are like that, some aren't. I mean, you know, it all depends on the people. Um, for myself, I, I love the idea of, uh, of a house where things have been piled on. And I think how you make it your own is very often by just adding your own stuff, mm -hmm. disregarding if it fits or not. And yeah. I think that there is a big mistake sometimes for people to sort of choose things because they believe that they fit. I think what you like is what you like and mm -hmm. whether or not it fits is not a problem. It fits because you like it. Yeah. You know? Well, speaking of what you like, can you talk about some of your favorite artists and artists that inspire you? Um, I think it's very difficult enough because there are so many artists. There's so many different centuries. There's so many eras and so many periods that you could, um, that you could choose from. I think sometimes what, you know, I love contemporary art. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I love abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. It is not what I collect. And um, so what you collect doesn't have to be a reflection only of what you like, but it's also what you feel comfortable around and what it reminds you in many ways. And I think I see a lot of people who force themselves to collect things because they are fashionable yeah. or because they are worth a lot of money. Yeah. And then buy them but they don't it they, and don't, they don't really feel that connection no, yeah they don't I hear you. Con it doesn't correspond to them it's not um it's not something that they if they had been left alone choosing something probably not what they would have bought not what they would have collected that doesn't that's make right. that's good because some collections are fantastically beautiful and you know people have no particular uh, feeling for what they're collecting and sometimes yeah. it's you know it's an abstract and it's sort of an abstract decision that people make so in your there's another question here in your own home do you have a color that you favor for your decor great question this, it wouldn't appear immediately in my house but it's blue i have blue. a passion which shade of blue I like I, I like uh, navy blue. I love blue, and uh, it's and I think all shades of blue I love, and I've always mm -hmm. loved. But in my house, there's hardly any blue. There's more greens and golds and uh, and oranges. There's almost no blue, so I don't know. So you... you know, sometimes it's so difficult to. <laughs> you know, one day I had a client who came to me and she said. Um, I was going to do a house in the country and it was a big house and it was a very, and she was a very determined, wonderful, strong woman. And so she took me to the house and we looked through the house and then she looked and she said, I want flowers. I want flowers everywhere. I want flowers. I want, I have flowered fabrics. I want flowered rugs yeah. and I want flowers everywhere because we're in the country and I want flowers. And I said, great, I'll do flowers. It's fine. We'll do lots of chintzes and things. And I said to her, I said, but before we do that, you should look through books and books of houses and decide, rip out things that you like and you don't like. And so we met a week later and she, in the first, same determined way, she said, well, you know what? I don't like flowers. I don't want flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want flowered fabrics. I want anything that you want. I just don't want flowered fabrics. So sometimes wow. you know, what we automatically think is what we like isn't sure. what we do like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, can you talk about kind of the design process when you meet with the client from the time you meet with them to the time you start a project? Kind of w walk us through that process. What's that like for you? So um, it's always very exciting to have somebody who telephones you and says, you know, I would like you to do my house. And uh, so you get to try to know the person on the telephone. Mm -hmm. You do your own homework because, of course, everybody through Google now, everybody, everybody knows everybody. So, and then you think, maybe that person will be interesting. And then you meet, 
usually I try to meet with them at, at the apartment or the house that they want that they want to do because it's what we're supposed to do. And so we meet there and then I listen to them. I listen to what they say about the house and they ask me questions, which is always very difficult to answer because mm -hmm. you don't. And, uh, and you want to seduce because this is part also of the work, seduce, seduce the person. I mean, we, sure. we would be good professionals if we weren't seducing people. So you want to say people will <laughs> laugh. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful in what you're going to say and that eventually it, they become your client. You're not going to contradict yourself. So you have to always be very careful. And then you listen to them, you look at the plans, you look at the drawings, you look at the pictures, and then uh, you elaborate a first project. Uh, and then you meet with the client and then you go over it and then you yeah. listen to what they say. And often actually, what you it's more important to know what you don't like than what you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always try to say that to people, I said, tell me what you don't like because that then I won't make the mistake and I won't propose it to you. If somebody is completely allergic to orange, you know, I think it's better to know before than after when you have a presentation full of orange touches here and then the person says, oh, I hate it. And then you have to be very careful because when, uh, when you present something, the first reaction is the most important. Yeah. And if the person says like this, then you know it's fucked up. Sorry. Yeah. You know that it's not going to work, not going to. Uh, well, and then you and I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure there were times where you walked into a presentation and you, you just felt the negativity or the energy was off, and you're like, you know, I can't deal with this person. I don't want to be in a, you know, year to three year relationship with this individual. So have you had to make those decisions where you just said, "Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm not willing yeah. to do this project." Yeah. yeah, you have yeah. to. You have to because life is too short, and uh, and also you're not you're not involved alone in any of it. You have your entire office that's going to suffer mm -hmm. from it. You have your life partner that's going to be really unhappy too, and so yeah. and you and uh, your therapists too who will tell you <laughs> again and again. I told you not to work for them. Yeah. So, so yeah. So what are some life lessons that? you could share with us that you feel are kind of the, the cornerstones of, of how you live your life and lessons that you've learned that you can share with us? You always, in my opinion, you always have to be open-minded. I don't think that, I don't think that in terms of, of personal taste, I don't think there are things that are bad or good. I think everything can be good and everything can be bad. I think blue can be a horrible color. Uh, and I think you so you always have to accept other people's opinions and advices mm. mm -hmm. and do whatever it is that you want to do, disregard them. But you have to, you have to hear what people have to say and you have to be always kind. I don't think there is anything that you achieve by being mean. And mm -hmm. I think being, being kind and uh, and and yeah. and respectful is uh, is the best possible way to be, in my opinion. Um, I and I don't think I have I don't think I have things that I hate anyway in design. I mean, I don't like fake anything, but you know, today. Yeah. What so, but. I think kindness is the one thing that will lead you through life and will prevent you from having ulcers. I love that. I love hearing that. And I feel like the more kind you are and the more giving you are, the more you attract and manifest those people around you um, in your life. And obviously through the clients that are attracted to you as well. So it's uh, so. definitely, a, yeah, easier and you way to live. I think also that there is, you never know enough. So I think that... Uh, I think it's very difficult in these times of coronavirus to concentrate to read because you feel that you have to think about so many other things. But I mm -hmm. think there is, there is not a book that I don't want to read. And I think to be uh, the more cultured, the, and that's what allows you to be the more open because you realize that every idea is relative to others and that uh, every style comes from something, something else. There is, 
you know, a chair, a modern chair is born from, uh, you know, a, a 14th century Gatet chair. I mean, it's everything, everything is an evolution and then you don't have the answer. There is no answer. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no definite answer on anything. You know, what says, oh, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, you have the answer, the problem. Yeah. Can we go back to your childhood a little bit and growing up, did you go to museums? Did you go to art galleries a lot as a kid? Did you, can you talk about that? I'm really curious. We, we do, we used to go, we were brought uh, always to museums. We visited museums, visited castles, visited, you know, all these, uh, all these things, went to the opera, went to the theaters. Mm -hmm. We were very lucky that way to have been offered many, many things that other people didn't have. And so, and I've always been very curious. So it came on, the, on not on deaf ears, and I was very, you know, very receptive to it, and always very, very curious. And my grandfather was a, it was a musician, and, mm. and was uh, was a little deaf in his office in in our house. And his, my grandmother in his in our house, uh, his office was near my bedroom. And so when I was home he would always listen to music and he loved classical music and he would listen to it very loud because he was a bit deaf. And so <laughs> you know, I would always, you know, go to sleep with Parsifal or Lohen Green or, and he loved German opera. And uh, so I, I guess I had a near that was open that way. And, uh, and so I've always loved music and, and just, I think music is probably the form of art that I admire the most. Oh, amazing. Did you ever play an instrument? I did play piano. Okay. Do you still play sometimes? Oh, I don't. I don't. I had, uh, I had, a, <laughs> I had a public, uh, you know, sort of uh, audition in Paris at Celle Playel, and then um, I didn't, I, I was so terrified, I was so beset by fear that I couldn't play. And then after yeah. that, never played again. Yeah, I had, an in, I had an instance when I was nine and I was singing in front of like 400 people at church and I forgot the words to the, to the song and ran to the back of the church and, and didn't sing for years. And, you know, so I know what that's like, especially if, you're, if we're more introverted people like us, yeah. it's harder to kind of get back out there in front of people. Very difficult. So I understand that. Um, what other hobbies can you talk about that you like to do? Obviously, architecture, art, designer, your passions and your work, but... But you know, hobbies are your passion. So I'm, I, I'm a very, very impractical person. Um, I don't know how to do anything. I can't, I can't, um, you know, I can't do anything. I can't change a light bulb. I changed one yesterday. Though. So I... <laughs> I can't do anything. I, I, if I go to a gar into a garden, to me a garden is a whole lot of salads and I just, I don't have, so my interests are just, you know, I live inside the house, I live in my books, I live looking at things and it's what I like to do. I, I love my dogs and so mm -hmm. I, have, I have them all around me all the time. What kind uh, of dogs do you have? I have Shih Tzus. I have oh, five. nice. Yeah. Five? Amazing. And you know, people always, um, I mean, people always ask me, I said, how do you live with your dogs in your house full of stuff and things? And it's like, you know what? I think people break more things than my dogs do. And yeah. if there's a little accident, so be it. You know, it's a little accident. One day I was at a dinner party and I was next to this incredibly grand in the English lady. And we, of course, both love dogs. And we're talking about our own dogs and our very, ill-mannered they were and she said to me she said oh i've abandoned worried about that i have a line of yellow at p high interesting amazing and what we a big big grand bowl beautiful house in, in, yeah. in, in england it's like oh who cares you know a little shit here a little shit there you know so yeah I mean, so you can be can be too precious yeah. No, absolutely. Do you travel with all five of them or do you take turns with them, taking them on trips with you? Oh, they don't. I mean, when we, we rent a house on Block Island, usually in the summer, 
and uh, my husband is doesn't like to fly, and okay. so and and the more private the better, and so <laughs> I was I wanted to I, and I flew with the dogs and him to Block Island one year, and the dogs were so upset. They looked at me the entire trip. Their face like, <laughs> why are we? And, and where, then, where are we going? Where are you taking us? Yeah. yeah. Why is it so noisy? And yeah. so we take them in the car. But they stay, they stay in the country. And, uh, and, uh, and they don't come to New York. And they wait for me. And so I come, I go to the country uh, on Thursday night. And then I come back on Monday afternoon. Amazing. The best of all well, worlds. Well, thank you so much. You, and thanks for all the questions, everybody. Um, this was a lot of fun. And, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a I, conversation. Yeah. And I hope to see you in Los Angeles when you're here. Oh, I'll make it. So. We can have a social distance meeting. <laughs> yeah. Complicated. How do you do that with people you've known your entire life? You, you know, I've been seeing people, but obviously with masks on and, you know, being careful. Yeah, it's, it's the, it's the new norm. It's Getting used new, to it. I have my, I have my masks here. <laughs> it's like, okay, anybody comes into the office, I have my mask, my gloves. Okay, good. <laughs> I know. Well, you're ready. You're ready. Well, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. I'll post this to my IGTV so you can watch it and share it with uh, friends or family. So um, thank you again. You're welcome. And I'll talk, and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great you. day. You Bye, everyone.